Hello and welcome to another edition of Heavy Hands. We are uh, we're hanging out here, um, just sort of. I don't know. You know what? You know what I think pe- uh, people like Phil is when we uh, when we start the show being sad. <laughs> so, so <laughs> the fans always respond really well to that. So I just want to say that um, later on in the episode we are going to be talking about both Rafael Sunsau and Juicy Formiga. Uh, two men that uh, I'm not ashamed to admit it, Phil. I have loved in my time. I have loved dearly over the years. Respected. Um, and, uh, Phil, I think you found what will likely be the title of this episode uh, just before. Do you, you want to you tell our listeners, I guess, what the theme of UFC 250 felt like for, as a result of our love for these uh, incredible journeymen, these incredible masters of their crafts? Uh, well, I mean, that's the one, that's the theme, isn't it? It's death of a craftsman. Death of a craftsman. Uh, these were two guys who had built their built their styles to make sense and to fit together. But the problem is that is with uh, these kind of complex uh, structures, there's always a kind of inherent fragility to them. Yeah. And yeah, it was it was sad to watch. Uh, Athleticism and, is cheating, but, uh, part two. Death of a Craftsman. Yep. Yep. Oh, well, we'll be getting to that a little later on. Um, the reason I start with uh, with that, with the UFC, the, the teaser for our UFC 250 recap review and breakdown, is that um, the card we have to preview probably won't take up all that much time in today's episode, uh, which is not to say that it's really a bad card, uh, especially for those of you who who take this into consideration as a um, you know, can I watch it for air quotes here free or is it a pay-per-view? Um, you know, for like a fight night card, I think it actually it's it's one of those that that looks better and better the more you look into the fighters that maybe you're not immediately familiar with. Um, there are actually very few matchups in this card that don't make a lot of sense to me. And most of them seem pretty fun or at least interesting. Uh Boy, the bummer of it all is that the main event is a women's flyweight fight. I think that's really all that needs to be said. Cynthia Calvillo, who I somehow didn't realize uh, until we just started talking about it, has missed weight four times in her career as a strawweight, three of those in the UFC, um, has finally, I guess, been forced to move up to women's flyweight, which uh, seems only fair. Uh I would have thought that might be a good move for her uh, because, you know, she, she's she's fast and she already does a lot of work with her speed already. Uh, but she's going to be fighting Jessica I, who has proven time and again that um, she is just strong enough to not be very beatable at women's flyweight. And uh, now she will be fighting a significantly smaller opponent. So I don't know, Phil. What are your thoughts on this scintillating main event? Uh, <laughs> it's a main event. Technically. It's a main event in the UFC. Um, yeah, I've, I've got to say, I'm, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of either one of these fighters. Yeah. Uh, Calvio is a fun grappler and a less fun striker, and... Jessica Rai is really just sort of an in- indictment of the women's flyweight division uh, in that it, it, she just keeps winning because she's okay. Mm. Um, and some of the women that she's fighting aren't. And uh, now that she's at a strength advantage or parity, she, she works a lot better. Mm. Um, as such, yeah, this is an interest. I mean, this is, I mean, it's not interesting, but it's difficult to call. Uh, I is I should I has been very she's she's worked well with that strength advantage. It has made a big difference. Her strawweight and bantamweight careers mm-hmm. were dramatically different. I mean, she got she got bullied by uh, Betch Cohea, yeah, and is now much more able to functionally bully people like uh, Jessica Rose Clark and so on. Which which is what her 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 pre UFC career was largely a flyweight, and like her 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 big career moment, um, likely what got them to bring her into the UFC was a win over Zoila Frosto, uh, with a standing arm triangle, and I believe that was at flyweight. Um, so it it has consistently been basically the difference for Jessica I is simply is she big enough to not get bullied? 
Yeah. So I mean, some of the and some of the differences between these women are not actually particularly pronounced. Like Jessica Rye is only a year older than Cynthia Calvillo. Yeah. And she's only two inches taller and has two inches more reach. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I am definitely expecting her to be significantly larger. And, and Calvillo clearly that's... isn't that small because she's she's pretty lean and she's had consistent trouble making uh, one fifteen. So, size advantage yeah, I mean, not I think that dramatic. Is... This is this is one of the elements of of cutting weight that that is sort of not not discussed, which is I think that's you know we've sort of mentioned it before. Some people are just denser than others, and yeah. I just think Calvillo is unfortunately a not particularly large uh, straw weight, and she is straw weight sized, but for whatever reason she's just she's just heavy for her size. Yeah. Um, and yeah i mean as we as we mentioned you know way back in the uh yin jay chick and uh shevchenko Don't speak fight whenever people have met in the middle and one of them has come from bantamweight and the other one has come from strawweight despite the fact that the strawweight is objectively the more skilled division the former bantamweight has always won mm. like or pretty much always i think i think there's been like one maybe two times the strawweight has won um out of, and there's been about eight hmm. when, and probably more than that by now, uh, when the, the former bantamweight has won. Um, so yeah, I mean, Calvillo started off as a reasonable wrestler, but that has in in the UFC, but that's sort of degraded out of her game. She's become a bit more of a zip around, throw big fast strikes, Heinish Hernandez type. Mm-hmm. I don't really see why that would work against Jessica Rai. She has a reasonably active jab. As I said, she has a, a reach differential. She's happy to bully people. I think she should be able to bully Calvillo. Yep. I don't see why I would expect Calvillo to be able to get takedowns on her. Um, I mean, uh, this is a, if the weight... I mean, as you said, I think the main X factor here is Calvillo's physicality because she might just be one of those people who has been, uh, you know, Jake Matthews style. She's been kind of crushing her own body under the weight cut that's true she might she might just end up looking physically uh like physically far more be- far stronger more explosive happier to be fighting mm-hmm. that's the one x factor but other than that gotta pick jessica right really mm-hmm. yeah I'm, I'm feeling the same way I mean, it, it is really just a physicality thing like we've had a couple examples in these last few weeks of um when it makes sense to, to pick a fighter based on physicality. Um, and uh, I think Calvillo is like a, a great case study for that because, um, you know, there, there, there are a lot of reasons you might want to pick her if she had a style that would like, I, I don't know, lend to the kind of advantage you expect from a fighter moving up. Like she, she's already pretty quick, as I said. She's got pretty quick hands. You know, she's got pretty quick feet. These could all be tremendous advantages against um, someone like Jessica I. Except that Calvillo has shown, uh, like against um, Joanne Calderwood, that even when it really would behoove her to pressure and get inside, uh, she doesn't do that well. So that would lead me to expect that Jessica I is going to have a pretty easy time landing her jab and her right hand and probably lots of, uh, you know, relatively meaningless kicks. Um and yeah, Calvillo, like you said, she just hasn't proven to be much of a takedown threat in the UFC. It just seems like once she started fighting slightly more physically fit fighters, uh, she found out that her her takedown technique just isn't really there. Um, combined with the fact that she just kind of doesn't seem to want to do that anymore. Like, I think she likes striking. Um, and it seems to be what she wants to do with people. Uh, yeah, I'm going to pick Jessica I. You know what I really like about Jessica I? I've been, I've been quietly giggling um, every time you talk about her. Is that talking mm-hmm. about Jessica I forces you to sound as if you have Jessica I's brain. You're like, I have, <laughs> I has good boxing. <laughs> it's the, the only, I has a good jab. That's how you have to talk about her. So that's been a small treat for me in an otherwise <laughs> painfully. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. a physicality differential, but also, like, I think I is just, she is honestly just the better fighter. She has a game just a more which is more style. built yeah, yeah, for, for for being an athletic parity or being even being an athletic underdog to people. That's one of the things about her fighting at bantamweight for this mm-hmm. amount of time is that she can 
sit down on her, you know, she can sit down and throw punches without getting out over her feet, and she can throw combinations, mm-hmm. and, you know, she doesn't really have much defense or, um, like, power or a huge amount of diversity, but, oh, well, let's do the next fight. I mean, like, it, ha- it has to be said, uh, I agree with that sentiment, but finally, it does have, to, it has to be said that um, I was never, like, blown out at Bantamweight. All of those fights, mm-hmm. she was in them. They were competitive and, and they were scrappy. So yeah, like having a style which allows her to hang with bantamweights without beating them, just add that little physical tweak, and clearly it makes all the difference she needs. So uh, Jessica I is the pick for us in the main event. Let's quickly move on. We're not going to talk about the co-main, um, even though I do think it's a, a pretty good fight as far as middleweight fights go. Marvin Vittori versus Carl Roberson was supposed to take place, I think, two weeks ago. And has been rescheduled for this card. Um, I think that is a... It's good. It's like uh, uh, Vittori's pressure and volume versus Roberson's uh, crispness and power. Um, should be a, a very entertaining fight as far as like non-ranked middleweight fights go. But uh, a bantamweight feature, you know we got to hit the bantamweights in the middle of this main card. Looks really interesting to me. Marab Dewalish Willie, Georgia's own is taking on Ray Borg, who just recently lost a very close fight to Ricky Simone in which he displayed the best boxing by far we have ever seen out of Ray Borg. He really seemed to like reach a new level just of belief and confidence in his hands, and that's great. He doesn't really need a lot more than that because he is, especially at bantamweight, phenomenally fast. Um, so that's the dynamic here, I think, is the the loading up full power on everything tireless Marab Dwalish Willie versus the equally tireless, less powerful, but much faster uh, Ray Borg. Pretty cool matchup. What do you think? Yeah, I'm loving it. Um, it's great to see Ray Borg getting back in there quickly. And mm-hmm. uh, He seemed to feel great after when that it last seemed- fight. Yeah. Uh, it really seems like, as you said, it seems like he's figuring out how to be a bantamweight. Yeah. Um, and he's figuring out what his style has to be because he can't be the guy he was at flyweight. And even then, you know, I think his flyweight game was still notable for a significant degree of incoherence. You know, GCA for Omega win aside, it it was it was hard to say what Ray Borg was great at apart from being fast and jumping on the back. Yeah. Especially, I think, were we talking uh, before the fight with Ricky Simone? Was it was it you and I or me and that bastard Zane Simon who were talking about Borg's game making a like a noted shift away from striking, like fully away from striking as a bantamweight? Um, so it, it was it was a, a corner I did not expect him to turn. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's definitely something that I've noticed. I can't remember whether we've talked about it specifically, but <laughs> but yeah, there was that fight, uh, which was the one. His it was one of his earlier bantamweight Casey fights Kenny? where he just wanted he just wanted to wrestle. Was it Casey Kenny? Um, I think it was one of the other ones. It was one of his um, Gabriel Silva. Who? I, yeah, I think it was Gabriel Silva. Yeah, where he just had a close, weird fight where he just went for takedowns again and again and again. Yep. Um, but yeah, so he he seems like he's figured out who he wants, and and is, as such, I'm I'm actually really happy to see him get back in there again, mm-hmm. um, because I want to see if he can like build on that. Well, you know, it's it's one of those things where while it's still fresh in his mind, I want to see him him try and refine that approach. I still think it's a tough matchup for him for the obvious reason that uh, Marab Tavilashvili is not a, the kind of person to give you any time to develop anything. Yeah, uh, he is just an absolutely suffocating. Uh, clinch wrestler and I thought again in his last fight against uh, Casey Casey Kenny Mm -hmm. I thought he looked I thought he looked remarkably good Mm -hmm. I thought the uh, for as much as Borg's striking looked improved in his his last fight I thought Devalishvili actually looked like a way better chain wrestler against Casey Kenny his, his ability to kind of shift to different techniques uh, whereas before he would just kind of have a tendency to just haul away at someone until he got them down you know it was kind of what got him into trouble against Frankie Signs it was a really great like technical wrestling performance so i mean it is a fight i kind of expect Valish Billy to win because he's essentially going to 
have he's going to have the fight that he had with Kenny, uh, which he won against Kenny, and Kenny won that kind of fight against Borg. Yeah. Um, so I, I do expect Valishvili to, to win, but I am uh, very curious to see what we see from uh, from Ray Borg. And I think it's just a great fight. It should be uh, in really high action, and the scrambles will be phenomenal. Because yeah. Even if he can get Borg down, Borg doesn't stay down. Right. Yeah, I mean, guaranteed action, right? <laughs> it's it's Wallace Willie. It's all he does uh, is take the fight mm-hmm. to his opponent. Um, and yeah, the, the the physical strength. The I, I agree. The 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 improved. Like it. You already said this. Perfect demonstration um, of of how improved his chain wrestling was, or at least how focused he was on it, because it was exactly the fight that Ray Borg could not win over Casey Kenny, even though that fight was close between Borg and Kenny. Um, there was really no question that Dewalish Willie out wrestled Kenny to the win. Um, and yeah, uh, I don't know. Like, I guess that, that makes this matchup a really stiff test of Borg's, uh, you know, newly sharpened, newly confident boxing game, because uh-huh. that's absolutely something that Dewalish Willie is and probably always will be vulnerable to. Um, if you can throw good, sharp, straight punches, if you can throw good body punches, which we saw uh, myriad blistering left hooks to the ribs uh, from Borg against um, Ricky Simone, that's a great, great weapon against a super aggressive, leaning forward, um, wrestling heavy fighter like Duwalish Willie. Um, so I expect if he can bring him out, the same tools will be very effective. Uh, but they weren't quite consistent enough to guarantee the win against Simone. And, um, yeah, a lot of Simone's success was his chain wrestling. You know, it was yeah. him just getting and in on the Billy largely out Simone Simone when he fought him. Uh-huh. You know, the, the crazy stuff at the end, notwithstanding. If that was a, that was a, a fight between Bantamweight's two biggest kind of wrestling madmen. Yeah. Uh, I think largely Tavalish Billy came out on top. Yes. So I think it's it's a weird it's a like I respect Ray Borg's balls a lot for this because uh-huh. it's basically him taking the same style matchup he lost to last time but harder. Yeah, and I kind of think like it even it it even works for Ray Borg. Like he hasn't been winning mm-hmm. all of his fights at bantamweight, but one thing that you can say, one thing that is in stands in stark contrast to his um, career before this is like he wasn't fighting. And now he's fighting really frequently. And we have often seen certain fighters uh, who just uh, flourish under those circumstances. Just the, the constant – constantly receiving new experiences, constantly putting yourself in fight mode seems to have sort of just calmed Ray Borg down a bit. It seems to have smoothed out his game and – like he, he's been there. He's, he's been in a fight just like this um, a couple times now. Uh, and he he arguably won the last one. He arguably won the Kenny one as well. But he 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 arguably won the last one in a manner which definitely definitely would be more effective than the fight he tried to have with Casey Kenny. So uh, I, I'm still going to pick the Wallace Willie. Uh, I just didn't see enough consistency, and I think I agree. He's just a, a bigger, badder version of Ricky Simone. Uh, he knows, I think, much more clearly what he wants to do. Whereas that, that was like a newly focused Ricky Simone in that fight, uh, Dwalish Willie has already sort of been playing that game very confidently for his entire UFC career so far. And I, and I imagine in every fight before. <laughs> it doesn't strike me as a guy who like has had that style coached into him. You know, he's more like a, a maniac that you just do your best to smooth out the rough edges. So I'm going to take Dwalish Willie. I just think he's going to get in uh, on Borg's legs a lot. And I don't trust Borg to have the volume, really. But uh, if Borg can just make a small step up from what he showed against Ricky Simone, just a little more output, a little more confidence in letting those hands go, the openings will absolutely be there. So it's a great fight. Mm-hmm. Oh, all right. Um, well, let's take a break. When we come back, there's maybe a couple others we want to cover from this. Maybe just one more. I don't know. Uh but it's not a terrible card. And if you have a free time on Saturday, presumably it will be starting a little earlier than a pay-per-view. You know, whatever. Watch it. 
we'll be talking about, uh, I don't know, Philly Jourdain, uh, Rosa Aguilar, something like that after this, and then on to UFC 250. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now, let's get back to it. Okay, welcome back to Heavy Hands. We are continuing to talk about uh, a couple of these fights slated for uh, UFC Fight Night, whatever it is, at the Apex Center. Main evented by Jessica I versus Cynthia Calvillo. The undercard is really the meat uh, of this event. There's no denying that. We already talked about Duwalish Willie Borg, but uh, there are two other fights we want to touch on very briefly before we get to um, UFC 250. Uh, boy, I wish I had the ability to like smash cut to 35 minutes from now, which seems to be the pattern when we finish discussing these fights. Really going to try not to do that. Um, but Andre Feely versus Charles Jordan is, uh, is I think, quite a good fight. Um, it's sort of one that I can see flying under the radar. But if you don't remember Charles Jordan, he uh, knocked out Du Ha Choi, the Korean Superboy, in his last fight. And uh, it was a very impressive performance. It was wild. That's kind of Charles Jordan in a nutshell, though. If you go back, oh, I, I guess I should say right up front, I uh, I did some scouting for this fight. So um, if you are expecting uh, unbiased or at least opinions <laughs> colored by my usual amount of bias, uh, you may not get that. But it doesn't mean I, I think I have a pretty good read on the dynamic between these two fighters. Um. And, yeah, having looked at Charles Rodin a lot, he's he's a lot trickier than he seems at first. Um, first of all, I think that's because he is a habitual slow starter. He really, you know, like he doesn't always, he's one of those slow starters who doesn't always agree with his own body. He will go out there just throwing reckless crazy shit. Like this is a guy who throws consistently like upwards of four flying knees per fight. Just trying them, just seeing what'll work. Several spinning attacks, whatever. The man is willing to do some insane shit. Uh, I think that combined with the the relative, um, I don't know, t- t- tepidness, t- tepidity of his first rounds can lead you to believe that he's kind of a crude slugger. Um, but while he does have punching power, seven of his ten wins uh, have been knockouts. Um, while he does have considerable power, he he's he's surprisingly deft. Like he he gets sharper over the course of a fight. Um, he'll go into a southpaw stance. His jab starts to make an appearance. He starts to pressure uh, intelligently. He's always a really um, a, a shockingly smooth combination puncher. He's super super willing to throw to the body. He's very consistent about kicking the legs. He's got a lot of attritional tools that uh, only further his cause as like a a momentum builder in the cage. Um, so yeah, I think Jordan like he he is he is quietly developing into a fighter that really might be ranked in this division sometime pretty soon. I think he's got a lot of potential. Uh, and then we have Andre Feely on the other side, who if he's going to win this. We'll probably end up looking, I don't know, a bit like a cross between uh, Desmond Green um, with the reach and the jab. And I don't know, I think TJ Laramie is a guy who uh, who out-wrestled Jordan back in the day. But this was before Jordan had developed anything resembling a get-up game. So like, this is the thing about Jordan. He learns over the course of a fight, despite the wildness, despite his willingness to be reckless... He learns the patterns of his opponent over the course of the fight, and he clearly learns and gets better from one fight to the next. Because if you go back to his pre-UFC career, uh, he fought in a Canadian promotion, I think, called TKO, which produces uh, quite a lot of good fighters. Um, he, he got out-wrestled so easily by this dude, TJ Laramie, and basically within two fights of that was like 
a master of the hip heist, was a guy with an aggressive guard who, once it became clear he wasn't going to hit the submission he wanted, would immediately and technically stand up or at least create a scramble. He has already begun to, to hone himself into a more stylistically focused MMA fighter, someone who comes into a fight knowing where they are strong and fighting to get to those ranges and to get to those phases or to stay in them. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite interested in this fight. I, I think, uh, Feely with the reach, with the jab, with the footwork, the, the improvements we've seen out of him recently, maintaining that distance are going to be quite a hurdle for Jordan. Um, but I'm not a hundred percent sure if Feely can sort of keep that momentum muted, can, can keep, you know, sort of like if he wins this, it's going to be a little like Sisyphus. He's going to have to keep pushing that stone back up the hill because it's going to constantly be trying to roll down uh, over him and build speed. Uh, so, I, yeah, I think we're looking at a real clash of two guys who really want to be moving in two opposite directions. And uh, each is well equipped technically and physically to to uh, to stop the other from doing that easily. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a this is a super interesting one because uh, I think one of the things about Jordan is that he has a style which doesn't necessarily lend itself to his frame in the way that you would expect. Hmm. How do you because mean? Because he's a, a lot. I feel like a lot of his style is that he's a blitzer. Yeah, but he's he's obviously you know he's a tall, lanky guy. I mean, we've seen people like this have success, you know, uh, like, I think Condit is an all right, is an all right analogy. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think, you know, in, in that he is a, a blitzer who will, uh, you know, have builder box rushes that he will change over the course of the time, uh, that he will change over the course of time and that he's, you know, a slow starter. I think another weird analogy, you know, Benavidez is a blitzer, but one who has to be, in some ways due to his frame. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's, uh, so he's one of these tall guys who kind of uses his reach to be a, uh, like instead of being like a spiky hedgehog that you have to run into, it's more like he, he uses it to be, uh, like Sonic the hedgehog and just throw himself yeah. at his opponent in a ball of limbs and be sure that he's going to hit them first. He, he is by far um, at his most dangerous in mid range and in close range. He can land really hard punches really close to his opponent. Yeah. And so against Feely, that's an interesting proposition because Feely has really settled into being someone who is happy. He, I mean, it, it's a sort of unfortunate quandary for him because he's happy and skilled in a mid-range kickboxing match, but can still be beaten there, right. as he was, you know, by Yusuf and by Johnson. Fast he doesn't guys, have, notably. Yeah, he doesn't have, uh, you know, tremendous power. Uh, he doesn't have uh, a, a lot of foot speed, and he's very reliant on establishing his jab. Um, and so we've seen him, so we've seen him, you know, he can be beaten in his speciality, but also we've seen him with problems tracking down just super dynamic people when he fought Rodriguez and just, and, you know, as we mentioned in the use of fight, he's not a great, uh, he's not great as a, as a concerted defensive fighter either. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, that, that Lobo fight is really kind of notable for its how how ugly it was mm -hmm. given the the size and the skill discrepancy between those two fighters it was way uglier than it needed to be he needed to wrestle way more than he had to and it was because of base a lot of you know basic errors in cage craft and you know the inability to have another idea uh when uh than just you know jab and circle I even I even think it was maybe it was it was maybe more like the the inability to rely on a good idea. I think this is a problem we've seen Feely struggle with throughout his UFC career, and he's tamped it down a bit lately. But like just being the guy who circles and jabs has kind of been hard for him, even in fights where it's working. You know, like even in uh -huh. um, really good performance over Miles Jury, 
he still consented to a few like mid range counter punching exchanges that he didn't need to. He was winning that fight from range. He was the better range fighter, the better asserter from long range. Um, and likewise, the, the fight with Shaman Marais, there were a couple moments where he was just like exchanging in the pocket. Uh, but they've become fewer and farther between. Uh, I think with Lobov, like that, that was such a clear example of a fight where Feely's reach advantage should have won it for him easily. And yet he kept stepping into the pocket and wanting to put together longer combos with his feet planted. Um, and giving Lobov like these clear signs that, oh, it's time to initiate ex- an exchange now. You're maybe not winning the fight, but you can trade punches with me at this moment. And, uh, yeah, that's going to be really risky here. Like avoiding that is, is really what it's all about. Um, one thing I will say to Feely's advantage is that, um, I think more so than probably more so than any of the guys he's fought uh, other than Michael Johnson. Um, Jordan is still vulnerable to well-timed strategic takedowns. Mm. Uh, Desmond Green hit five or six, I think, in their fight. Um, like he he did a great job. One, I I love Desmond Green's performance. Like even though I don't always love watching his fights, he's he's a little stiff, a little stilted sometimes. Um, he just answered basically every Jordan rush through the first half of the bout with a jab. He just ret- retreated behind a jab, didn't throw it hard. Just stuck it in Jordan's face and continually killed his uh, his bursts of momentum. Didn't allow him to build on any one of them until the very end. But most notably was that uh, while doing that, Green had a relatively easy time uh, just timing entries. And Jordan, is he's gotten much better since that Laramie fight I mentioned at like sniffing out the takedowns in the open space. Um, he's gotten much better at getting back to his feet for sure. But he still kind of throws insanely loaded punches with both feet fairly close together right under him. Um, and yeah, like we saw, yeah. we saw Feely out wrestle Dennis another. Bermudez. Yeah, that's a, and that's a great point because, uh, Feely, as you meant, as you kind of alluded to, he has been good at setting up counter takedowns. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's just, been fighting against people who are either you know great wrestlers in their own right or they just have concrete hips as we found out with uh so yusuf yeah um so it, it hasn't been something that's gotten a lot of play and i think it is something where a lot of the time i think hitting his takedowns does seem to drain uh feely a bit mm. I, I think just i don't know i, I feel like it's one of those things where slotting it into his own cycle of techniques he wants to throw it seems to, you know, it seems to wear on him a bit more than uh, just uh, a straight up mid range kickboxing match where he seems to be fairly happy. Sure. But yeah, I mean, that's that's a great point. I think, you know, if he can if he can run a kind of ersatz GSP game right behind the jab and takedown, I think that could, that could work really well. Yeah. Basically, that worked for for Des Green well enough to win the fight. Co- combined with the fact that, like, uh, because Jordan knows he's not as sharp, I think, at long range. You know, he's got ki- he's got good kicks there. They're very counterable, uh, but he's a steady kicker. Um, he has some tools, but it's really like the close range, the mid range punching that makes him super dangerous. And, and I think he feels that, and when kept at bay, can become kind of a jumpy. Um, shell-based, defensively-minded fighter. Um, and yeah, like uh, Des Green was able to put him in that mode and then just bang him to the body a bunch of times when he covered up, um, which sort of sounds like the kind of stuff Feely did successfully to Shaman Morais. And then when uh, when he was put on the back foot, he used footwork, jabs, and counter takedowns. Um, and yeah, I think Feely can do that. I don't know. Feely, Feely's always been very durable. Um... And yeah, he's, he's got a five or a six inch reach advantage and a considerable, a two inch height advantage, but five or six inches of reach on Jordan. Wow. So I, I think that's maybe the deciding factor, but, um, it, it really does. It, it'll be a good test for like the, it'll test the depth of the technique we have seen out of Feely recently because Jordan, as we saw, even in that fight with Des Green, one he clearly lost, he, he does not like to be denied. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't get discouraged. He might get frustrated, 
but that tends to um that tends to play itself out as just like uh reckless furious charges he's going to reach a point where if it's not working he is going to try to force the fight he wants and feely may indulge him in that so i think it's it's really interesting um i i will have my eye on jordan for sure going forward as a ufc featherweight i i think he sort of just quietly came in and lost to Des Green, a huge step up in experience, basically. And, and yeah, but his last fight showed he's dangerous. Uh, he can go to war with some of the meaner punchers in this division. And um, he is way smarter than he seems for the first five minutes of any fight. So good shit. I'm picking Feely. How do you feel? Um, I might pick Jordan, you know. Yeah. Um. I would see why. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's just, I, th- I think I would like to see Feely win because I think you know, similar to the sort of Borg versus uh, Devalos Feely fight, I think it's it'll be a, a real test of his ability to implement like a focused game plan and one that he's not, he hasn't always been a hundred percent comfortable with. Mm-hmm. But it, like against the people he's lost lost to, uh, like and the people he's won, I think the consistent difference is just aggression. Yep. They've been um, quick, aggressive punchers, <laughs> largely. Yeah, and or even just you know uh, when Godo Fredo Pepe just came sure. out after him immediately. Uh, he, I really, I think, really think he does like to dictate the pace. And yeah. against low pace fighters, he's he, you know your juries and your um, your juries and your Shaman Marises and your Hacker and DSs. I think he's yeah. he's very happy in this kind of fight. I but like I can't get that lob off fight out of my head. Uh, so I think I'm going to pick Jordan. Yeah, makes sense. Should be a good one. Say say one thing for Feely, even when he doesn't get the fight he wants. Uh, in fact, that is usually when it turns into a very exciting fight, is when he can't quite get the yeah. fight he wants. And Jordan yeah, is, is built to make those fights. Yeah? Yeah, he is game. Yeah. There's one thing you can say for him. It's a good one, man. One of one of the one of the little mm-hmm. highlights of a of a surprisingly deep undercard, I think. Uh, do we want to say like some very quick words since we took almost seventeen minutes talking about that one uh, about Charles Rosa and Kevin Aguilar? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this this is an interesting sort of even weirder read, as you said, even weirder redux of Aguilar's fight against um, Barzola. Yeah, it's Rosa is a weird high movement kick grappler type guy i think he probably has slightly less slightly weaker wrestling than barzola yeah but a little more like diversity and uh trickery to his game uh it's one of those fights where i think i i'm gonna pick aguilar to win it because he won that fight before and fairly handily but he hasn't looked great in his last two fights and i feel like for someone who's reliant on bullying people it does look a bit like his confidence might be shot yeah uh, yeah, it hasn't been a great look. Um, they have notably notably been very quick fighters. You know, like Barzola's not slow. He's a pretty good athlete. Um, but they've notably, notably been like quick punchers uh, in particular, people who can enter and, and just crack Aguilar before he can time anything. Um, not to mention, of course, Ige's uh, wrestling and ground advantage, but he did drop Aguilar, I think, like a minute into the first round of their fight before anything else happened. Um. So that that kind of that, that makes this look like a more forgiving matchup for Aguilar because Rosa is of all the crazy things he is uh, fast is not really one of them. Uh, like I described him, I think as a as a weird blend of Enrique Barzola and a I don't know lightweight uh, Emmanuel Newton, featherweight Emmanuel Newton. Mm-hmm. I guess though I think this is yep. a lightweight, isn't it? Yeah, no weight cutting here. Um, so yeah, he's, he's, he's got the, the sort of weirdness, the pace, uh, the energy, uh, of a Barzola. He has some of the same goals, but technically it's a lot of like bizarre spins. It's a lot of weird, like slapping hooks where his head is just constantly like just out of reach. Um, like never forget, he gave a shockingly tough fight to Shane Burgos. People forget, I think, because Shane Burgos ended up knocking him out with like a beautiful series of three perfectly timed knockdowns in the third round. But he was frustrating the shit out of Burgos throughout that fight. Uh, it just, just, he's not an easy target. 
And yeah, I don't know. Like, do I think Kevin Aguilar is better as a sort of, you know, I, I don't know, counter based puncher than Shane Burgos? Yeah, that's a good point. I don't really. Because no, he isn't. He isn't. Um, I don't think he's better at setting up that right hand. I don't think he's better at uh, picking up on patterns in like a weird, frustrating fight and discovering the knockout he he may in fact need to actually win in the third round the way that Shane Burgos did. Um, in fact, I think we have seen that what makes Aguilar particularly effective, this was true in the Barzola fight and the Glenn fight, is his counterpunching. Uh, he's got a good defensive jab, and when people are sort of forced by that to come in after him, he shows off some nice footwork, finds some good angles, lands some good counters, throws good in, in surprisingly tight combinations. But, um, you know, Charles Rosa might just, like, throw spinning kicks at him from really far away uh, and, event- and occasionally look for takedowns. But I think he could honestly outstrike Aguilar just by being really weird from a range that Aguilar doesn't really have tools in. But he's, yeah, he's much I'm slower. Buy it. He's much slower. That's the tricky part. Mm. Am I picking Charles Rosa? It feels like I am. Yeah, that seems fine. Okay. Close didn't, fight. Yeah, didn't expect it. It should be fun. It should be weird. Um, but yeah. Once again, pretty solid undercard, and uh, that, as it turns out, <laughs> not quite the 35 minutes I jokingly predicted, but that is an entire segment two. So um, look forward to what will almost certainly be a long segment three, in which we are going to look back at UFC 250, including Amanda Nunez's win over Felicia Spencer, and then subsequently after the first couple rounds, Felicia Spencer's cursed ghost, uh, and um, yes the two tragic deaths of uh, two of the UFC's greatest and most long-standing perennial contenders after this. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support heavy hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. You can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. Welcome back to Heavy Hands. We are talking about UFC 250 now at long last. And you know what that means, Phil. We start with the main event, which I don't know about you. I've noticed a sort of theme <laughs> around the, <laughs> these uh, coronavirus era main events. Um, tell me if this tell me if this has stood out to you. Uh, they've been is tragic <laughs> appropriate word. Uh, I don't know, maybe horrifying, maybe horrifying. That's a pretty good one. Maybe some other um, helpful qualifiers like um, um, inevitable. They have all felt rather inevitable and uh, I don't know, maybe relentless, relentless, perhaps uncompetitive is a is a is a good on the nose sort of description for these. I yeah. mean, uh, to be fair, like most of them have started off uh, with some, you know, with some excitement and back and forth action. Right. That's true. Then quickly. This one did not. This didn't this even have that. Huge. No. <laughs> um, so yeah, this one within seconds was the fight. It was going to be. Yes. Yeah. I was, I was really glad the moment it began that I had like talked myself out of my contrarian position or rather had just, you know, like actually watched Felicia Spencer's fight footage before recording the episode last week and realized that no, she is not going to win this fight. Uh, she has a hell of a chin. Like, I really thought that, um, she was eating shots as cleanly as Cyborg was landing from Nunez, that she would, she would go down. And it was in fact to her tremendous misfortune that she did not, because basically within the first minute or two of the fight, she was eating blistering right hands from Amanda Nunez. She didn't have the defense. She had no range tools. She doesn't have the wrestling. In fact, Nunez seemed to just want to make a point by out-wrestling her several times. Um, 
And yeah, it's a shame because like we, we have all these performances that really strongly suggest that Nunez has, um, you know, I don't know if you can ever fix some of these, these underlying issues, but has a very, uh, capably like papered over her, her underlying flaws. And yet, you know, just like the fight with like Raquel Pennington or whatever, it's uh, Jermaine Durandamy. It's, it's like these people just aren't good enough. To bring out those flaws. It's, I mean, I, I, it, that's a credit to Nunez, right? Because they used to, her, the opponents at this same level used to simply be good enough. Um, a lot of it came down to Nunez making bad decisions and getting carried away and, and really undoing herself. I think it's become very clear, uh, that at least against this kind of opposition, um, which is on a par with the people that she sometimes lost to before her championship career, she has really smoothed out her process and calmed herself down and can now just succinctly, well, not succinctly, it took 25 minutes, but can now just capably thrash um, an opponent anywhere she wants to for 25 minutes. Yeah, I mean, basically it's just there are probably still routes to beating Amanda Nunez and the boxcar homer is not one of them. <laughs> yeah, distinctly... We've distinctly determined this now. Yes. Just hanging around with her, she is, is not going to cause her to self-destruct. Yep. And that was pretty much it. Yeah, I mean, it was a we, we called it as a horrific matchup. It was a horrific matchup. Credit to Felicia Spencer's toughness. No credit to her corner for keeping her going out there. Well, that's... And no credit to the judges for scoring like one ten eight between the three of them or whatever it yeah, was. What the fuck was that? I think two judges gave one ten eight round. One judge just had it fifty forty five. Yeah. How can you justify that? This was like a series of ten eight rounds or worse. Basically, every round was a ten eight. Yeah, um, I mean, I kind of feel bad about for Amanda Nunez now because she's. I mean, she's got no one left to fight. Yep, that's it. Apart from. Shevchenko again, which she has nothing to gain from anyway. And yeah, I mean, she's just cleaned out her division. There's just more fights like this. And um, yeah, at this point, let's sad, just let's but... just stick her in a co-main event slot and have her do exhibitions with Nina. Until a, mm -hmm. a new challenger materializes, that would be fine. Yeah, I, yep. I, I do want to say just before we move on, like, I, I think the real story of this fight was Spencer's corner. Um, not only, you know, did they, as I, one of those times where even a know-it-all of, of my caliber really hates being right is when I can just confidently say, Hey, everyone watching this right now, I know you're feeling the same way as me. They're not going to stop this fight. Don't worry. They won't even think about it. Um, they didn't, they didn't even ask her how she was after the fourth round. She came back to the corner. No one asked her how she was feeling. They just started giving her advice. But even more than that, even more than the the all too typical sort of carelessness these people have towards their fighters uh, health and safety the advice itself was abominably bad like felicia spencer needs to find a new camp i don't usually say stuff like that <laughs> i've usually you know i have a lot of respect for small camps um i don't think everyone needs to go chasing like a super gym or a celebrity trainer or whatever but um when after that fourth round um, when, when after the, the fight had reached a point where the fact that Nunez did not go on to finish Spencer honestly seemed like a, a, a merciful choice of Nunez's, um, when after it reached that point and Spencer returns to her corner and her coach tells her fly at her, fly forward, throw a flying elbow when she has not demonstrated mm -hmm. once throughout the course of the fight that she can even keep her feet under her while throwing a jab. And then as she's being thrashed in that fifth round, you can hear the cornerman shouting, jump off that cage. Because that's that... literally the advice that would be shouted by the drunk bro yes. in the audience who is watching the UFC for his first time. Yes. If her corner had been, like, just a couple shirtless drunk dudes who said, like, slap her in the tit or something, it would have been just as helpful as the actual real corner advice she received from her trainers. So, like, she needs a new camp. She's a fighter with potential. She has incredible toughness and heart. 
You know, like she doesn't look shaken. She was trying the game plan for all five rounds, just like against Cyborg. She would be a great fighter, uh, I think, if she were equipped um, and actually prepared by better cornermen and trainers. So, Spencer, Felicia, get on that shit. You know, I'm not trying to lose anyone money out there or anything. That's not my goal, but you need to stop working with these people because they didn't prepare you, they didn't protect you, and they had no idea how to help you when it became immediately clear the game plan was not going to work. So, yep, Amanda Nunes, very good. Uh, unfortunately, basically in a position where she cannot be tested because no one is good enough to test her anymore. Uh, but let's go ahead and talk about one of the two people's main events. Uh, this is at least the, you know, like the, the nerds main event. Rafael Sun Tzu is so crafty, Phil. He's such a clever fighter. He's so hard to hit clean. You know, he's really adaptable and he can really figure an opponent out over the course of the fight. Um, and he was just about to start doing that. <laughs> mm-hmm. He really was like just on the cusp of figuring Cody Garbrandt out when uh, Garbrandt felled him with the dumbest counter right hand ever thrown. Literally the biggest, widest, a, a right hook which began at Cody Garbrandt's knee. Uh, was traded with a much tighter right hook from Rafael Asuncao, which has, uh, yeah, all I, all I felt after this fight was, well, I'll say it again. Athleticism is cheating. Youth is cheating. It's not fair. It's bullshit. Uh, how come Cody Garbrandt can still be so much faster with a hairline like that? It's not fair. You remember when I told you how amazing it would be <laughs> if Cody Garbrandt... <laughs> Ran fuck. back to the top of the bantamweight division and became champion again, just with big right hands. Shut the it's fuck starting, up. baby. No, no, <laughs> it can't. <laughs> it started in the saddest possible way. Oh. I don't know. Give me your take. Let me calm down. Give me, give me your read on, on on what we saw play out over those two rounds. Um. Okay. So there were there were a few things uh, that. Surprised me a bit. Um, I think this is a bit of a callback to uh, Cejudo Cruz. One of the things that we didn't call out uh, after that fight is that I think we overestimated how much of a hard matchup it was for the younger fighter. Uh, because with Cejudo Cruz, you know, we figured out that there were, he they figured out that there was a relatively simple way they could just defuse Cruz, right? Uh, in uh, and and leverage a physical advantage that probably would have been there even in Cruz's prime, uh, in that Cejudo always would have been a much harder shot-for-shot hitter who would be able to just kick out Cruz's lead leg. That mm-hmm. would always exist. And similarly, yeah, there are a few elements for this that I didn't really uh, key in on before the fight. One is I didn't realize that Garbrandt was going to be... The, had that much of a size difference? Because uh, I guess because I, I remembered him fighting against huge guys like Cruz. Sure. Uh, but I was expecting there to be more of a... Uh, like, I was expecting to be more even, but uh, Asensal really is kind of stocky. Um, secondly, uh, Garbrandt's punch selection, which has not been to his benefit, in some other fights, actually kind of helped him out in this fight. Because so much of what made uh, Asensal effective against Font is that he's he's really good at having a, a number of, you know, counters and cross counters and so on to the jab. Right. And Garbrandt just doesn't do that. Yep. And it left Asensal kind of stranded out of range trying to figure out what to do. And he got into a sort of ugly low kicking competition, which which uh, Garbrandt just kind of won because he's faster. And he's I think Asensio you know, was he was he, starting to to get control over the kicking battle by the end of round two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as he was, you know, he, he'd also been flash knocked down and, and yeah. then got knocked out at the end of that round. So yeah. it was a it was a, a tough like it was tough to take away that many positives. Right. Um. 
So yeah, I mean, it, it meant that yeah, Garb- Asensal really was forced to initiate in a way which he's, as we realized, he's, he's just not very comfortable doing. Right. Um, and you know, it led to some of these super ugly wheel kicks as he was trying to corral Cody. Um, and you know, when they actually got into a few pocket exchanges, you could see that. Asensal still did have a clear edge. Yeah, he I landed that a was couple what he was really trying to bring nice. out at the end. Mm-hmm. But as you mentioned, like there was just this. It was a he was up against someone who was faster and bigger, and stronger and younger, and he didn't have a consistent way of uh, of taking those tools away at all. Really. Yeah. I mean, I, the thing, the crazy thing is, is I, I, I still don't, it doesn't feel like it was a fight that a Sun Tzu could not have won. Oh, no. Like, if he had been as, a credit to Cody Garbrandt, he knew that his route to, to victory in this fight was a boring one. Mm-hmm. Like, he, 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 he knew he needed to go full counter mode. I love, by the way, that he, I think Zane said last week, um, that, um, Cody Garbrandt uh, looks at improvement in a, in the same through the same lens as Junior Dos Santos, um, where he just will like add a new move and be like, "Okay, now I'm prepared for this phase that has troubled me my entire career or whatever." Um, and Garbrandt, yeah, you just yeah. What kind of idiot would you, what kind of <laughs> idiot would show up for a for a you know tough style matchup just prepared to throw wheel kicks? Eh. <laughs> what are you saying, <laughs> Phil? Nothing. Go on, pussy. Say it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying Cody Garbrandt was the smart man in this fight. <laughs> Say it to Rafael Sunsal's unconscious face, you bastard. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, Garbrandt just came in like um, this was a good move. I think just kicking a lot, like that's his new layer. Is he just throws a lot more kicks? Um, mm-hmm. And it's genuinely not a bad. It, it, it's a lot more effective for him, I think, than anything that JDS has ever developed because Garbrandt is by far at his best as a counter puncher that plays into his hand speed and his power. Uh, it plays, it, it, it covers over his defensive liabilities in the pocket when he can force his opponent to cover that bridge, uh, to cross that bridge first. And um, yeah, this is like the old Machida thing. It's a game that Asunsao himself has played and I expected him to, to play and win narrowly in this fight is you just, if you have a steady diet of kicks, to continually remind the other person that they are, you know, not overwhelmingly, but but still losing at long range, that's a great way to make them cover the distance, to make them open themselves for a counter. Um, so it's a really, really simple thing. But uh, it seems to work pretty well for Garbrandt's style, and especially here with the speed advantage. Um, you know, since I was just starting to figure out the kicks, was just starting to see them coming. And yeah... I don't know. What else is there to say here? I, I guess I just want to say that, like, in that final exchange, I think it, it, it was a tremendous example um, of of what, like, speed, youth, athleticism does. Uh, because that was an exchange, the way that Asuncao approached it uh, was going to be decided by speed. Uh, Cody Garbrandt was, like, backed up to the fence he did this really big, exaggerated slip slash duck uh, as Asuncao fainted forward. And he let his head sit there for like a split second, which uh, can be a really effective way to bait an opponent. You know, like a head movement, you, you can be timed for doing head movement thoughtlessly, but you can also use it like as an action to, to prompt an answer from the opponent. And if you're ready for that action... If you're aware of where your openings are as you put your head in, you know, the given slot, then you can you can set up counters by preemptively moving your head. And that's what Garbrandt did. He put his head in this position. He was super loaded up, basically squatting over his right leg. And uh, Asuncao saw the opening that Garbrandt was giving him. And what he should have done at this point in his career is faint, uh, get the range, Get the timing with a jab, you know, like try to probe out whatever trap Garbrandt might have been setting. But what he did, because we've not seen a very good aggressive, like offensive jab game from a Sun Tzu as um, as friend of the show, Shiram. Oh, oh, my God. Tom said it so well last week. Morala Daram said last uh, said on Twitter 
um, the last good jabbing performance from a Sun Tzu, his win over Rob Font, which was a very good jabbing performance. It, it was all defensive, retreating counter jabs. Um, and he's just not yeah, that. I think it was, as I said, yeah, it was, it was Font jabbed with Asen yeah. which really opened his game up. Right. And uh, Garbrandt didn't do that. He just hung back and he's like, you jab first. And Sun Tzu hasn't really done that for a long time. So the game he decided to play rather than probing this trap was to just pounce on the opening. He put himself into, into an exchange where both guys were ready with their right hand. And this time, fortunately for Garbrandt, the faster guy uh, managed to win it. So that, that that's really it was all also one. Mm-hmm. It was also one of those things where, you know, it, it's also a long career of of Rafael Asensal of fighting MMA strikers who do MMA striker things. Mm-hmm. And one of the many things they tend to do is that when they make big, when they make slips, particularly big slips, MMA fighters take their eyes off their opponent. Yes. And Garbrandt did not do that at all. Very when he good. was in that crouch, he was watching Asensal the whole time. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's why I think, you know, as we said, you know, 15 years into his career of fighting people who do that kind of thing, when someone does that kind of thing in MMA, they generally have no idea what's going on. You know, sometimes they might just blindly swing and knock the other guy out, a la uh, Velasquez Noguera. But, you know, it's not really going to happen that often. But as you said, like... Garbrandt was watching the entire time. Mm -hmm. He was laying bait. Yeah, very good point. All right, well, that was sad. Um, I guess we can very quickly talk about the other craftsman who died. It was Juicy A Formiga. Um, This man has... We should should shout out uh, Sterling as well. Oh, we're going to hit... I I want to hit that with a little little more depth, actually. I just want to... Oh, okay, okay, okay. Because we're on the theme um, of, of craftsmen being murdered by, uh, you know, like, younger, dumber fighters. Um, Juicy Formiga, this guy has been, like, top contender in the flyweight division basically since its inception in the UFC. He has repeatedly been the Ryan Bader of 125, the guy that title challengers beat to get their title shot. And um, it just kind of looks like he also has slowed down. Uh, I think you said before, Phil, that he he can no longer win a fight. He just can't win a fight where he can't take the other person down and control top position because he's he's not a huge submission threat. He's not nearly as quick as he was a couple years ago on the feet, even though I think his his boxing game has continued to sharpen up technically. He no longer has the speed or the confidence. Um, and yeah, unless he's like Davis and Figueredo slotted perfectly into what Formiga can do right now as an opponent – but without that really like narrow path to victory being open to him, he just like gets chewed up and out kickboxed by Alex Perez, finished by leg kicks in the first round. Yeah, I mean that it really is like l- low kicks really are the young man's weapon, aren't they? Uh huh. I think we've seen that uh, going back to things like uh, Anderson Silva against. Um, who was the guy who beat him recently? The incredibly depressing one. Chris, Chris Weidman? Oh, uh, um, Derek Brunson. Oh, oh, I know what you're thinking um, of. It was uh, Cannoneer. Oh, yeah, Jared Cannoneer, of course. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, we did the same thing with Asensal as well. You know, it, it really is just a... It's a way of measuring durability with people because right. the only way to beat a, leg, a low kick is to really, uh, you know, aggressively, unless you have, you either have to have a huge foot speed advantage yep. or you just need to step in and trade, really. Um, you want to, you either, you want to counter it. It's a weapon it. you can reliably just sort of throw like with blind confidence. It's a big sweeping mm-hmm. shot that if you're quick or tough or just confident enough, to throw it even without a setup, um, you can just kind of batter older, slower fighters. Yeah, it's, it really is a, a physicality measuring weapon. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that, that was what we saw from this. And I, I do want to say, like, this was it was it was very sad to see um, because yeah. I mean, Formiga didn't even feel like he had his shots ready. No, um, you know, he didn't even really try and take 
take Perez down much. But this was also like a big technical improvement from Perez mm-hmm. because he has sort of felt like he's been in limbo a bit in terms of what his approach should be. A little bit like Borg. Sure. But he's he's been trying to figure things out. You know, his um we've seen him be uh extremely aggressive in the past. Um and it felt like Benavidez might have beaten that out of him a bit. Right. But uh, against Torres, I think it was, where he just overwhelmed them. We were like, oh, shit, who's this new uh, Alex Perez? Right. But then his fights since then have been a bit more, like, pot-shotting. But this was this was great. Combination punching, low kicks, uh, like, counter-punching against UCA Formiga mm-hmm. uh, very effectively. Like, he looked great. Looked like a future contender. Yeah, we we saw um, a similar turn recently from Alex uh, Alexander Hernandez, where he like we, we were worried basically because he was learning lessons pretty late into his career, you know, being beaten and then like feeling like he had to adjust his whole style, and I, that's was basically my worry about Alex Perez as well, uh, is that you know he made it this far, he's not. Uh, you know, we, we think of him as a prospect because he hasn't been in the UFC very long. But he had his first fight in 2011, and he's had 29 of them now. It's been a career for, mm-hmm. for sure. Um, and he fought Joe Benavidez and just got like real prospect loss looking kind of fight for a guy who was that late into his career. Just got overwhelmed and battered by a super confident, super experienced power puncher. And um, – his approach changed after that. We, we saw the death of aggressive Alex Perez, um, at least the death of the, uh, the Perez we had seen in that Torres fight. And, uh, but here against Formiga, yeah, he was like, he, he had his, his nice low kicks and everything, of course, but he was also initiating exchanges and, and then exiting on an angle and, and cracking Formiga with like nicely timed left hooks as he was getting back to safety. Um, you know, it, it was, Formiga, you know, a guy who has recently lost to people who just have like speed and power advantages, except for that Figueredo fight, maybe not the stiffest test uh, of these newly developed tools. But for a guy this late in his career, Perez does seem to have found a, a new sort of comfortable position to sit in as a striker. Uh, and what I'm curious to see is will yeah. that will that style carry on? Um, and if it does, how does it inform his wrestling game? which is really his A game, uh, does that start to uh, kind of wither going forward as he invests more into this kind of striking game, or was this just kind of a one-off thing? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I hope we can... I, I would like to see him fight, like, say, Brandon Moreno, for example. Oh, sounds awesome. Plus, person who beat Juicy Yeah. Uh Yeah. But yeah, another and another fantastic... Uh, like developmental striking performance out of Timo Yama, who have really yes. like been producing some wonderful strikers lately. Yes, Chito Vera over there and the team. Uh, all these like little guys basically have just been apparently honing each other into markedly better fighters. One fight to the next. Um, okay, well let's go back to the main card because uh, the real people's main event, the one everyone was excited about. All of the all of the technique nerds. We're squabbling and, you know, going back and forth, just not really able to suss out to any great degree of accuracy what Sterling versus Sandhagen was going to look like. Um, I don't know. I feel like we actually got the dynamic pretty good. What we did not expect uh-huh. is how quick and one-sided it would be. Um, in fact, credit to you, Phil, because you were the one who pointed out in the midst of our discussion with, with Tom Elliott last week that um, Sterling – approached Jimmy Rivera with intense pressure from the very beginning that even though that that's not what we usually see out of him, I don't even think it's uh, a core tenet of his style of fighting. It was something he could do situationally when it made sense. And whereas with Jimmy Mm -hmm. Rivera, you know, the goal was to, to get to, to, to surprise the wrestling defense to, to prevent him getting a read on his counters. That's different from Sandhagen. I think, I think here it was more a matter of, we don't want Sandhagen to get a roll going. We want to pressure him before he can settle in and start pressuring us. But in practice, it was exactly the same. He came out super hard. He threw a few strikes. 
once he got Sandhog into the fence, boom, clinch, immediately to the back, immediately on the neck, and it was over. Yeah, so I mentioned this on Twitter. I think like to, I think the three of us, we together, we we managed to like synthesize without the finish. We managed to synthesize that that fight really well. Sure. Um, so yeah, we got the the early. Pre- we said you know Aljamain Sterling's got early pressure. We mentioned the size dynamic and the last the last person uh, Sandhagen had fought, who was close to his frame, was Alcantara. Alcantara basically forced Sandhagen into the fence, clobbered him, and then almost submitted him. Yep. Um. Uh, Tommy Elliott talked about how uh, Sterling does his best work when he forces people into the cage, how he goes directly to the back, how Sandhagen lets people do that. Right, how Sandhagen uh, we invites mentioned the how, uh, Asens- uh We mentioned Asensau and how he was able to get Sandhagen's back mm-hmm. um, and how Sandhagen was kind of able to big his way out of it in a way that he might not necessarily be able to do against someone with... Yeah. Uh, size parity that he was able to get like his elbows and feet to the ground in order to spin and get her and like turn in in uh Aston Sal's guard so like I mean we didn't call the finish but like for the 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 shape of the fight for however long it went I mean I don't think we've done much better than that in the past that's true we've, we've, we've frequently done much like, worse <laughs> yeah con- particularly considering it was like this was a game plan involved around uh that was uh, centered around like a wrestler and we and you know that's not obviously not our um forte so and yeah obviously huge thanks to to tommy who came here to like really mm-hmm. like break down the elements of their grappling game as well mm-hmm. yeah i mean what what can i say other than that um they're still doing yawn versus aldo <laughs> for the uh-huh. title. <laughs> even though i'll say one thing is i will say one one thing is that this proves once again. I think that uh, Ultraman Sterling is still one of the most objectively exciting fighters uh, to watch in the modern UFC. Mm-hmm. Like he's just had nonstop, incredibly fun fights for the last however long. Yeah, last bad like one last... was uh, was against a Sun Tzu, who does that to almost everyone. Yeah, I mean, maybe like the Barrow fight wasn't great. Okay, but fair enough. Since he's really, since he's really come into his own, mm-hmm. I mean. All of those fights have been bangers, and often often in different ways. Um, yeah. So yeah, fantastic to watch. Uh, thrilled to watch him fight for the title against Aldo. I mean, can I can I just say like um, we 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 always get excited when fighters get better. I think we're now settling into knowing what Aljamain Sterling can do. But uh, before this incredibly exciting five fight run that you mentioned, uh, he was not this fighter. Like I think the first time we saw mm-hmm. we saw any of the boxing game that we now associate with him materialize was in 2017 he fought Augusto Mendez and showed off yep. new head movement and new boxing skills. Um, even or at the end of the Asuncao fight, perhaps also in 2017, it was only three years ago. And he has gotten so much better so quickly. Uh, I love to see it, man. I absolutely love watching fighters develop and improve. And, uh, frankly, I hope uh, Aldo injures his fucking rib. I hope he actually lies about it this time and has to pull out because I, <laughs> I want to see Jan versus Sterling. I have no interest in seeing Jose Aldo fight for a bantamweight title off of a loss in which he looked worse than he ever has inside the octagon. Um, I want to see Sterling versus Jan or I want to see – that's it. That's what I want to see. Sterling versus Jan or mm-hmm. Sterling versus Cejudo. Those are two fights I would very much like to see right this instant. So, yeah. Um, I don't know. Is there anything else to cover? We pretty much hit all of the really big stuff. Ian Heinish did the damn thing to Gerald Mearshart. Just was a stronger dude to, to hit Gerald mm-hmm. Mearshart with, with the punch. Uh, yep. Sean O'Malley easily passed the Eddie Wineland test. Um, I was talking on Twitter. I'd like to maybe see him against like John Dotson or Rob Font yeah. next. Someone either tougher and more annoying, or someone with like some reach parity and power uh, in Font who can test him. Or alternatively, uh, Cody Stamen, or someone even suggested Uriah Faber, 
which I think would be an interesting test. I think O'Malley has more than proven that he he can take on the more washed veterans, and he's ready for the guys who are still a little bit closer to their athletic best. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends. I think a Faber fight, that depends on... That's basically a referendum on how much they want to rush him. Yeah. If they give him Faber, I mean... Because if he wins Faber that, he's, there's Faber. no getting out of the of the. There's no getting back off the big stage if he were to win that. Yeah, exactly. Um, I will say, uh, Stamen Kelleher ruled. Uh, yeah. I think if we've if we've learned one that there's one thing better than bantamweights, it's bantamweights that don't have to cut weight. Yes. Um, yeah. Because this was, I mean, this was uh, great. From, because it was it was Stamen's sort of traditional fight, in that he starts off super quick and then maybe slows a bit in the third round. Mm-hmm. But all it did was that rather than him not slowing down in the third round, it just meant that his pace was way higher throughout the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was yeah he was throwing combination punches. He was his defense looked really good. Yeah. Um. And yeah, it was just a it was just a fantastic performance from him. Um, he's still not a big puncher, so I think he's probably better to stay away from featherweight. But uh, so it makes me sad that we're probably not going to get to see this Cody Stamen again. Um, but yeah, this was a this was a phenomenal fight, and uh, really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. On a technical level, it looked like he sort of answered some of the problems he had with Song Yudong, but also, mm-hmm. yeah. How 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 um, sustainable is that back down at one thirty five? I don't know. All right, well that's UFC two fifty pretty much in a uh, in a massive nutshell. Um, we've spent now well over half an hour talking about this card. I think that'll pretty much do it for this week's episode of Heavy Hands. I, I think we gave uh, this upcoming I versus Calvillo card more than it's due in terms of in depth fight coverage. Um, hope all you people out there listening are staying safe in these troubled times. Hope you are doing your part, if you can, uh, in any way that is safe or amenable for you to do so. Uh, help out your fellow citizens, people. Come on. Be a good Samaritan. Be a member of the team. Um, let's see. Phil, I'm going to guess uh, in the sad absence of uh, David Castillo, no preview or anything like that coming out this week? Sadly not. Nothing coming out this week. What about yourself? Well, I am working on um, an Asuncao Garbrandt article. Uh, I'm not going to go ahead and tell you to check that out because I have no confidence that it will be published by the time you watch this. But it did make me feel things, and that's usually a, a good uh, a good starting point for actually having the motivation to follow through. So um, yeah, I was I, I just started I'm, working on. I'm, a piece. Ass- I'm assuming your keyboard keeps shorting out due to the tears dripping on it. Yeah, I've had to. Does anyone? By the way, any listeners, find me on social media at Boxing Bush B U S C H, or let Phil know. He'll let me know at Evil Greg Jackson. Um, that's on Twitter. And uh, let me know if you know of any, like, covers for a keyboard or, like, models of, like, water. Are there any underwater keyboards? Because, like, my desk has, like, a little rim. So it really fills up pretty, qu- <laughs> pretty quickly. It's a little moat of sadness. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so just let me know. Shout out if you can help me out. But, uh, yeah, the goal is to finish an article called something like, uh, Garbrandt versus a Sun Tso when speed wins. And I really just want to sort of fixate on the overall dynamic, that final exchange, and how it was exactly the kind of exchange that a Hafele Sun Tso was never going to uh, win over Cody Garbrandt. So um, don't keep your eyes peeled for that, but uh, maybe keep your eyes on the Twitter I just plugged if you uh, want to know when and if, if and when it does come out. Otherwise, make sure you check out the Heavy Hands Patreon. I'm going to try to get some stuff up on there really soon. Maybe another boxing commentary if I can sort out my syncing issues. Uh, Maybe just another sort of solo topic. I don't know. Maybe I can uh, persuade one of these these, uh, vaping scooter rubes to to join me on the Patreon and talk about some shit for for all you guys out there. Thank you very much for your support, everyone. Again, I hope you're staying safe. uh, Staying safe in this time. And uh, thank you so much for listening. Come back next week. We will be recapping, hopefully, what turns out to be the actually satisfying undercard of uh, I versus Calvillo. And then we have an okay-looking card, to be honest, coming up. 
between uh, with the main event between Curtis Blades and Alexander Volkov. Don't hate what I've seen so far. So uh, come back next week. We'll talk to you about that. Until then, if you came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. 